week we are talking about discipline, or the second week of our family series. Last week we talked about rhythms and how there's the rhythm of life. And I went through certain times of the day. When you get up, there's a rhythm. When you're in the car, there's a rhythm. When you eat, there's a rhythm. And then when you go to bed, there's a rhythm. And those are what I called golden opportunities to reach out to your kids, your loved ones, and to make good decisions and good choices there. Discipline is the balancing act of love and limits. And as soon as we say discipline, we go back to our, the methods that we were disciplined with, and we either think, oh, they were awesome, or they had no idea what they were doing. I knew some of you when you were younger, and you, I hear the amens in your head. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's a scripture that we use a lot when we talk about discipline. But when we think of disciplining our children, we come to a couple of thoughts. And this isn't just about kids, so if you don't check out yet, if you don't have children, or if your children are older. But we think, okay, there's the Old Testament that's old school, that's outdated. That's one thing that people will think. The other thing is scriptures and Proverbs will come to mind, the one that I just read, or the classic Proverbs 13. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. And those are the scriptures that we have, and we, we juggle with those, and we're not sure what to do. But here's the key. Discipline, discipline means applying appropriate consequences to encourage a child to make better choices in the future. That is the goal. That is the goal. Remember this, parents. Proper discipline has short-term discomfort for long-term gain. Short-term discomfort for long-term gain. Those of you when I said discipline, remember when you were disciplined and you were like, ah think I want to do that, that was wrong discipline. Improper discipline or harsh has long-term discomfort and long-term resentment. The Bible talks about discipline again in Hebrews, New Testament. I'll read the passage. This is the key scripture out of that, Hebrews 12, 7 through 11. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? What do we, what do we, when you see a kid that's never been disciplined, what do you call that? Oh, brats. I didn't think of that, but brats is a word that might come to mind. I always think they're kind of like wolves. They're just wild. You're never sure what's going to happen. If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are all illegitimate and not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years doing the best they knew how. That is the key. 90% of you who were disciplined who have the bad experience, they were trying, they just didn't know what in the world they were doing. Remember that. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. This is the verse on the scripture. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So we read that discipline is in God's plans. It is in part of the family plan. If you know those families that don't do any discipline, you call them brats. I don't, but you do. Those are the brat families, right? Remember, years ago, there was a doll that was called Bratz? Clearly, they had no discipline. (laughs) Were they all girls, too? Hmm. I'm just asking questions. You guys are answering. So God's plan is discipline. If we have children, God's plan is discipline. If we're children of God, the plan is discipline. So really, you can't get away from it this morning. Sorry. So if you thought that you were going to skate by because you didn't have kids, your kids are grown up, discipline is for all of us. Because discipline is for building up, not tearing down. Remember that. Discipline is for building up, not tearing down. In parenting, we have this battle of being supportive and and not supportive, of being demanding and undemanding. 
all of those things. But we know that discipline is part of the recipe, but that's a recipe that you're really not sure what to do. Last year, or last week, I talked about my car and how the oil was almost oh, not even on the dipstick when I checked it because I didn't check my rhythm. And my brother's shaking his head like, you're such a, I don't know. I don't know, he's just shaking his head. I'm going to tell you another car story. So discipline, there's certain rules when you're on the road that are kind of like discipline, right? Driving too fast may injure a car. That's happened to me before. I remember one time I was in high school. Let's see who is here, if there's any families here. I was in high school, and there was this car, and our road growing up was like a washboard on good days. Wendy, you grew up not far from us, and you know, like, it would bounce you. One time it bounced me right off the road. Now, I was going too fast. But that's all I was doing. Off the road, into the guy's yard, around a sign, and back on, and I just kept going. Now, I, as, as a 17-year-old kid with a muscle car, I'm like, that's how that's done. <laughs> and remember, if somebody would have had a phone, I would have been famous today. <laughs> but there were other times where I hit those washboard bumps, and I remember one time my dad's like, I don't know how this shot got busted in the back. I'm like, Probably because we're hauling kids all day. We're hauling Wendy's brothers, we're hauling all of us around. It wasn't because I hit that bump it too fast. But discipline is important there, it's in dis it's, and it's important in our lives and in our families. So why do we struggle with it? Because we don't like discipline. Because if I say the word exercise, that's discipline. It's discipline in my body. We talk about the 15 minutes around here, that's discipline reading your Bible. But those are hard things. Sometimes we just do the opposite of what our parents did because we thought they were so bad. We're like, Whatever they did, I'm going to just do the opposite. And that's not the answer either. The end result in a discipline in life when we remove the consequences is pr a problem. And sometimes we do that. We, just be we don't discipline because there are consequences as parents. And we do this for a couple of reasons. I'm going to give you four. There's more than this. But the first reason we don't discipline or give consequences is we don't want our kids to experience pain. Let's think this through. By postponing consequences in a young child, they don't have any pain. They get to be teenagers. Now, if you grew up in the 80s, pain is your motto. <laughs> Amen. But let's say you have a teenager now and they don't have any pain. And then they get out of your house, and the world's like, oh, you didn't have any pain as a teenager. We're going to give it to you. Because the world will drive you to your knees. But if we don't have pain as children, and children typically have small pains. Because as parents, Tessa was over last night, and some of her woes were like, whatever, right? They come to you, and they're like, well, this is what's going on. You're like, suck it up. But for a kid, that's a big thing. But remember, nothing in the child, nothing in a teenager. You get to the adult, you have no coping skills because you've gone 20 years without learning how to deal with pain. That is setting our kids up for failure. We want to dose them in an appropriate way. They need coping skills. The next point is, is we want to prevent our kids from having any disadvantages in life. You are convinced that your kids are going somewhere. Good for you. <laughs> I've treated athletes for the last 22 years, and I cannot tell you how many pro athletes I've treated. Maybe three maybe one that actually made a tour pro when I treated them. Parents come in, their kids are very hurt. Can you patch him up? Can you get him on the field right away? Let's get him out there. No, he needs to sit out. He can't sit out. No, he can't sit out. He's, he's, he's going somewhere. I'm sure he's going somewhere. He's going to go to the next level called surgery if you don't take care of this and just let the consequences of the injury take its turn. 
Or better yet, we undo mistakes because we don't want them to fall behind. Going behind, clean up your kids' messes. That's no fun. That sounds like a job for someone other than me. We don't want them to fall behind. Sometimes we do this because we are living our unlived lives through our children. All right, I'm going to say that again. Pull your toes back under your chair. It happens all the time. We want them to be everything we couldn't be because of, and you, you fill in the blanks there. They don't need us to clean up their problems. They need us to empower them to solve their own problems. It's easier. Next point. Sometimes we remove punishment, negative consequences, because we feel the negative situation will harm the kid's self-esteem. Well, maybe you need to look at your methods. But many times it's for us to avoid facing the trauma of them suffer. It's not about you. It's about your kids. It's not about you. It's about your kids. I understand that it's easier not to do things. There are times you're like, I don't care what you do. So yesterday, I'm going to give you another example. We had a bonfire yesterday, so there's, I could go uh, like examples of kids all day. And there was a baseball bat, and it was a metal bat, and it was on, so I have to give you a reference point. It was way over there, and the adults were sitting here, and some of the kids were on like the deck with the metal bat. And we're all like, oh my. So they got rid of the metal bat, and then they picked up the plastic bat, and it was Tessa who was hitting. Jana had already hit, and Tessa, who's seven still. Evelyn's, we're calling him a friend because I'm not using boyfriend on camera. Cole was holding the, the, the steel bat and swinging it. Now, there's consequences all over in this, right? And you know what the adults did? We didn't do anything until we heard this. She hit him right in the head. She did. She hit him right in the head. They wore us down. We were only out by that fire for a couple hours. But kids can wear you down, so sometimes you're worn down and you're like, ah, oh, Whatever. But that's not a good reason not to discipline. The next point, we want our children to love us. We want to be loved. Many of us want our kids to love us. It's very important to us. So we make it our purpose to elicit their love when we interact. Yeah, again, it's good that they love you, but you're still the parent. You have a job. Your job is to set limits, set boundaries. Love is part of the equation. If you have kids that all they have is love, what do you call them? This side knows. You may have a different name. I don't know. <laughs> that is damaging, though. You see, the purpose of parenting is to prepare our children for life so that they can eventually leave the nest ready and strong enough to fend for themselves. Our kids don't need us to be their pals. They need us to be their parents. Kids don't need us to be their pals. They need us to be their parents. So there's two themes here that I talked about. The first theme is this. It's not about you. It's about your kids. Suck it up. Paraphrasing me. Second one is it's about preparation. You are preparing them for success down the road. If you talk to counselors, a lot of the, the well, really the first 10 years is what seems to make a child into an adult. So whatever happened in your first 10 years is part of the equation. Now, I believe that with the power of the Holy Spirit, being saved, renewing your mind, those things can change. It's going to take some work. Just like when we go through things, we learn to adapt and grow. So the next time we can better face the situation, that's what we want to do with our kids. And sometimes discipline is part of that equation. We need to move from a place of controlling because this generation of parents, you guys are controllers. I'm just going to say that's what it is. All the research is saying that we control a little too much. Kids go outside, and we're watching them. Paul, who watched you when you're outside? 
No one. Richard, who watched you? No one. If I could start now and I could go till 12 o'clock, you'll know, probably go to one o'clock, about things that we did without supervision. A lot of it was good. Not much of it was illegal, and we're around. But that's how you grow. Randy, do you have somebody watching you growing up? No. Randy's like, no way. <laughs> So we have to understand that we've gone to this point where we want to control everything and that might not be the best thing for our kids. Now that we're looking at it, even though we can, it might not be the best thing. But I want to talk about how to get away from some of that control and what that looks like. And some of it is understanding where we come from, from our discipline ideas. So one of the things that Part of discipline is control. And these are, you can also look at this as boundaries. You, healthy boundaries are meant for their safety. They're meant for consistency. So a zero is what you call, come on, this is the third time. All right, from now on, this means you guys say something. I don't know what you're going to say. So zero is, and then 100, whoever said that, nice job. And then 100% is total control where they, you're telling them how to brush their teeth, when to brush their teeth, where to put the toothbrush, and then when they do it, you're going to do it for them because they're doing it wrong. Does that make sense? So it's a lot of control. So would, and some control is very normal and it's healthy. Boundaries are healthy. So we also have this scale. We have the zero. I'm not, not, don't start yet. Man. We have the zero. So these are, these are sad cases because these are children that are totally neglected. Totally neglected. So there's no love in their life. And then we have the 100% scale, which is the goal is to love your kids a lot. It's not to not love them. But chances are you were in one of these four styles. You mix these together on a graph, it looks like this. So what you get is you get four different quadrants. And if you get a couple of double zeros, it's going to be ugly. The first one is permissive parents. Permissive parents are fearful parents. They're indignant. They give, give, give. Very, very low control. These children end up with very, very low self-esteem. The next one is the neglectful. Neglectful parenting style maybe shouldn't even be a style. These are parents who are very uninvolved. This is where we'd say they're being raised by wolves. The parents are often too busy dealing with their own problems, with their own issues, to take care of their children. So they're so busy taking care of themselves that the kids are just running around doing whatever. These kids have, typically have emotional scars and no lasting relationship because they don't know how to bond with people because their parents didn't bond with them. Another one that, as we look at what we want to do, not, not something we're going to strive for, but something that is probably with this many people in the room, some of us grew up in that. Next thing is authoritarian. These parents are the fighters. That if you say, it's cold out, they're going to say, it's warm out. I don't need a jacket. Put a jacket on. They, they, they want to win the battles. Not only the one battle, they will not lose a battle. This gets old. This is, often has unidirectional communication. Basically, it's me, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And then, but, no. You don't, no, but, no. You don't get a but here. You, you be quiet, and you're going to listen to me. These, typically, these parents are not great at expressing love and affection. That bar is set very high, very, very high. These are the kids that if they get a, 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 a B, B plus, A minus, they're shaken because they've got to show that report card to someone because that bar is so high. Just so you know, kids, I think all of you should fail one test. It's liberating. It's liberating. Is that, have we all done that? I got 
All right. This, can, this can, uh, control is so hard. So they're 100% in control. They control everything. Control is so tight, you know what the kids do? They break free because it's so tight, they're like, I'm out of here. I can't deal with this. This is crazy town. And they rebel. So that typically p- produces a rebellious kid. And then we have authoritative. And this is the, the, the beautiful mix where we have love, we have boundaries, we have something called communication, where there's, there's, but, oh, can I hear your point? Oh, you might not be right, but can you look at it from this perspective? But there's a reciprocal relationship. They're responsive. They're not overbearing. Clear boundaries and a connection. So I'm going to give you this so you can see it. It makes a little bit more sense there if I put it like that. You can see where there's the control on your left. And then love on the bottom. And that's without that. And like I said, that is the goal. If we are going to look at these four, this is, this is probably the best researched as far as parenting styles that's out there. And it was a big number, and it was, it was just is a good study. And it's pretty up to date. So... It, what this says, though, is that parents who express love well and maintain a high degree of control or boundaries, and that starts with more and then you let go, right? That's the whole goal is to, to let them adapt. Luke, after you failed the first test, did you fail the next five in that class? He didn't. You know why? Because Luke learned his lesson. And that's the goal with our kids, is to produce well-rounded and kids that can adapt. Because if we've learned anything in this last year, it's this world is changing. We want to produce kids that can adapt. So it goes back to this balance of love and support with limits. Now, if you're a parent, I'm going to give you four tips. This context is not meant for us to go through problem solving on each of your kids. If you want to do that, talk to myself, talk to Pastor Paul. We can, get, we can do a round table where we talk about things where it's a little bit more focused. But remember this, your discipline needs to be consistent. Don't change it in the middle. You don't like it when the rules change. Don't change the rules on your kids. Your discipline needs to have clear boundaries. If you're not home by 10 o'clock, this is what happens. Whatever it is, don't keep shifting that. Don't say seven and then say 10. And when the answer is, why? Because I said so. Because we all love that answer. No, clear boundaries, what's acceptable for your family, what's not acceptable for your family. So when they know, when they know when they cross over not acceptable, they understand that there's going to be a conversation and a consequence. And the consequence is for long-term benefit. It needs to include communication. We already talked about the 70s and 80s a little bit. Hard on limits, not high on communication. A lot of kids didn't know what was going on. There was just discipline being thrown at them like a machine gun. It's a true story. It's not cookie cutter. If you try to discipline my brothers and I the same, it won't work. One of us or two of us are strong-willed, Maybe all of us, I don't know. Ask the wives. But it's not cookie cutter, so it's not going to be the same. Your family's not going to be exactly the same as my family because it's your family, it's your unit. You have your own rules. So you may be thinking, you know what? I'm pretty good at parenting. I've knocked all these out. I'm in that red circle right now. Are you really? Is what I would ask. But... The question is, so how does this apply to me? I mean, worship was good. Becca, thank you. Worship was a good time. But now I'm sitting through you talking about kids. I don't don't have my own kids. We all have to look at discipline because the rewards we seek in life begins with submission and discipline and training. I'm going to say that again. The rewards we seek in life begins with submission 
to discipline and training. Remember the story of Daniel in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter one? If you don't, I'll tell you about it. But Daniel and his friends were brought in. They were slaves and they were brought in because they were the, they would be, they'd be on channel four right now, the brightest and the best, right? They're brought in and because they were the brightest and the best, they were given privileges. They were educated and they were, they were shown what to do on rules and academics. And because of that, they were... They wanted them to be fed like everyone else. Like, oh, come on in. You're doing a good job. But here's what they said, verse uh, Daniel 1.8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the, uh, the chief official for per permission not to defile himself in this way. He's like, no, I don't think so. Daniel's showing self-discipline here. Goes on. And Daniel says this. They're like, no, I think we're going to get in trouble before Daniel says anything. They said, we're going to get in trouble. The king's going to be mad. He goes, well, what if we do this? What if we test? He says, please test. And that word test, you can say discipline. So please test or discipline your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the, men, the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he's like, let's do a test. We're going to do it this way, and you're going to do yours your way. We're going to be disciplined, you're not. So we agreed to this test and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, Daniel and his friends looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine. I'm sure they, Daniel and his friends were favorites uh, and gave them vegetables instead. But let's go back to those, those Israelites. They chose not to indulge but to be disciplined with the will-enforcing challenge that it would build stamina in the interior of our lives. Sometimes we forget that today you're preparing for tomorrow. Does that make sense? You are. I was reading a book, and this gentleman, he was taking a mentor out, and he would take the mentor out, and the mentor, he'd say, can I buy you a cup of coffee? The mentor would be like, no. He did that for a couple weeks. And finally he goes, what? don't you like coffee? He goes, I love coffee. But there's times where you have to say no to yourself. Because if I say no today to, to coffee, I might be able to say no to something much greater down the line. But if I can't say no to coffee, those other sins are going to really hit me hard. I thought, wow, what a, that's powerful. Thomas Merton wrote this. We are most free when we are under discipline. You know, and I know, that people exalt freedom right now, that I can do anything I want, whenever I want, however I want. It's not really true. He goes on to say, no one is freer than the person whose mind, body, and soul are conditioned to grow and flourish. True freedom has to be under discipline. Athletes can't do anything they want if they're not disciplined. They don't play. That's the way it works. The same principle applies to us and to our children. In order to grow, we need discipline. We need, we need to understand boundaries. It may be easier to not have discipline in your life. I wouldn't argue with that. I like laying on the couch, watching TV. I do. And I like being in control. But in that, do I grow? Not really. Do you want to be ready for spiritual battles? Because they're coming. I guarantee you, like we talked about with David, a battle is coming your way. And if it's not coming your way, it's coming to the person behind you in, in this church or in front of you because battles are coming. Do you want to have answers for your kids when they come to you and say, hey, what do you think about this? Do you want to understand the best discipline plan? Do you want to be able to pray with someone or give them advice? Pastor Paul, can you give me a scripture on this? Pastor Paul can give you scripture on lots of things because he spent time doing that. He spent time in the word. There are times where it's not going to be Pastor Paul because he's not going to be here on a Sunday. He may be actually taking a Sunday off 
And they may, be, they may come up to you and they may be like, you know what, I need a scripture for this. But if you're not spending time, if you're not prepared, if you're not disciplined, you're going to have to be like, I guess you're going to have to check in Pastor Paul I'll give you his phone number. And I'm just going to plug that. Don't do that. Because he don't answer. Amen. Boom. It's true. So because he doesn't answer, you need to be disciplined. Because I'm not going to answer my phone every time. And you need to be disciplined because you need to be able to get through these things. So what does that look like in our spiritual life? We've talked about kids, but talk about spiritual life. Sometimes we extend, we extend our prayer time. We extend who we pray for. If you don't know what to pray for, grab a church directory on your way out. Start at the back page and work your way forward. Spend more time in reflection. Read and rest. Just read and rest. You'll be amazed at what comes to you. Talked about scripture reading. We start with a discipline of 15 minutes a day. 15 minutes a day will change your life. If you attest to that, raise your hand. Change lives. Research says that if you do it more than four times a week, a lot of addictions, a lot of problems go down. Sacrificial service. Tithing. Sometimes we have to be disciplined with our money. I can spend a lot of money on coffee. It's just a true story. And then I take those numbers and I look at what I'm tithing and do those numbers, where, where's, what's the relationship? I need to be more disciplined. You need to be more disciplined. But money is one of those things that sometimes we don't, we don't even look at that. These things matter, especially if you wonder, why am I not growing? Is this the end of the Christian road? Am I at a point, am I, have I reached the, the place where I am one of the disciples? Where, you know, I, get, I can get through 80% of this pretty easy. It's not really uncomfortable. I don't have to push in a little bit. Sometimes it's just a matter of discipline. Remember Daniel and his friends. Back to the food conversation. They said no to the choice food, the choice wines. If you skip forward into chapter 3, these, these guys were in a place where the whole world was supposed to bow down. And they were supposed to bow down when the music played and worship a false god. And what did they do? They didn't. And what was the consequence? Fire. It was death. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O oh, king. But if not, let it be known to you, O oh, king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. I have to go back and I have to think, okay, was that saying no to the wines the first choice? Were they setting themselves up for success because back then they said no? Something to think about. Remember, proper discipline has short-term discomfort. They had short-term discomfort and long-term gain. I'm still reading their story how many years later? If they would have bowed down, I wouldn't have been able to read that. No one would have cared if they didn't drink wine because they would have been smoked or alive. We go on through Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather healed. My challenge for you is to look at your life Add a little bit more discipline. Parents, look at what you're doing. Be objective. Chances are we all have something to work on. Honestly, we do. These slides are going to be, I'll post them later onto our, our page so you can see some of that stuff. And my notes are on you version. But parents, I have something for you. Somewhere. It's this. So if you have kids, you get this game to play with your kids. It's called the stacking chair game. And when you play this game, I want you to remember that 
Discipline is a balance game of love and of limits. Okay, there's a couple things on the card. One is my slide. The other set thing says that proper discipline has short-term discomfort for long-term gain. Take this card and put it in your Bible. Put it somewhere where you will see it. There's stuff on both sides. I would encourage you to take a picture because I want to see your kids beating you in this game. Really. All right, the kids are going to come up. And we are going to have, so if you are in a family, I'm going to have the families come up and just separate out. Pastor Paul, if you could help me. Aaron, could you help as well? Gordy, could you help as well? We're going to pray for these families. All right, kids, come on up. Pastor Paul, Brother Aaron, and Brother Gordy, you're going to give you a gift. So it is, it's going to be one per family. You are going to learn to share because it's my rules. My boundary is that you will share all right, so if you have, and if, actually, if you are even a teenager, I'm going to ask that you come up as well. And if you have kids that are not here, I'm going to have you come up too. Lee over there. Yeah, I'll beat you later. All right, so kids, you have a game in your hands. I want you to play the game with your parents. And then after that, I want you to come back and tell myself or Pastor Paul who won. <laughs> All right? Everyone have one. Okay. Kids, while I have you in here, this is your summer challenge. My favorite book of the Bible, if I have a favorite, is the book of James. If you write that book out with a pen or pencil on a piece of paper, all of the chapters, and you hand it to me, I will pay you $20. You going to help me with that? How old are you? <laughs> Now you have until the end of June. The end of June, I will never ask you for it. Some of the other leaders may, but I will not ask you. You have to bring it to me. So it'll be a $20 gift for you. Age limit is 12 and under. Paul, Pastor Paul. <laughs> we'll put some details together, coach. All right, I'm going to have families that have games stand up. All right, they're on the spot now. I want you to look around and pray for these people because they're raising kids. All right, let's stand together, church. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for families. I thank you for every child that is here today, every adult that is here today. God, I pray that, that as we look into your word, that we are, we are prompted by, by the Holy Spirit to be more disciplined in certain ways so that we are prepared for the next battle, to help the next person, to show the love of Christ in a different area than maybe we've done before, God. I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed, church. Say hi to someone before you leave.